morning. Nice. You had Red Bull this morning. I found the peach nectarine Red Bull. I've found that I just don't stop drinking coffee until afternoon. And if I do that, I make it. So peach nectarine taste goes down like so right. So good. Uh, So that's a little sweet for me. (laughs) So welcome back to the sweet. (laughs) I'm not touching that with a 10 foot fall. So welcome (laughs) back to the blasters and blades and apparently caffeine podcast. (laughs) <laughs> so hey all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the blasters and blades podcast just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies a place where magic is king the sky is the limit and space is the place so without further ado we have the one the only the great and mighty podcaster mr ian j malone so can you, tell the, woo-hoo, can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself yeah, man. Um, well, uh, on the podcasting end of things, that's a funsies thing that I do with a couple of other author friends of mine. Um, you know, we're, we're all sci-fi slash fantasy authors. And when we got together at cons, the crazy thing was we're all sports fans. And people found out about that and they wanted to come over and talk to us about sports. And then they found out that we like to smoke animal flesh. And uh, they were like, all right, let's talk about brines and let's talk about rubs and let's talk about craft beer versus draft beer and domestic beer and whiskey versus craft whiskey and da 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 da. And so we decided, let's make a show. We can talk about all these things. And so that's how I got into the podcasting game. Um, I'm all about the whiskey part. Oh, yeah. 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 No doubt. In the meat. I'm good. I'm down for those parts. There you go. We, We discuss them quite often on our show. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of that was born out of, out of being a writer. Um, none of that would have happened if I, if I hadn't gotten into the writing game long time ago and, and, uh, and gotten out at cons and, and had a chance to meet people and share drinks at the bar and tell each other stories and, and, uh, and get to be friends and colleagues and peers. And then, you know, all that stuff just organically happens. And the next thing you know, you're all, you know, having drinks and doing podcasts together and, you know, doing interviews with the same people you met at the bar at the last con. <laughs> I'm so. pretty sure that most business at cons happens either in the vendor's room or at yep. the bar or at the bar. Yeah, no doubt. Good times. Good times. <laughs> so the next part of this introduction, dear listener, is how we first met them. So how did you first uh, meet Ian, Seska? At the bar. At the bar. And I'll be the designated podcaster today as the sober <laughs> one with my 24 ounce bottle of water. <laughs> no, I met Ian at Fantasy 2019, which was the first Fantasy, and it was a f- fun, small, nice, fun convention. I mean, yep. your first year is always a small year, so that's always a good thing. But mm-hmm. there's a charm in that. I, I mean, I anybody who's listening to the show knows I love the Dragon Con, but there is a charm in actually being able to see the multiple people in multiple locations sure. that you've already seen before. Um, so we met in the bar, and it was, hey think you uh, may have i don't know if you've done your first book yet oh yeah but, um because honestly the books kind of blend together after <laughs> like, sure. I, don't know, I don't remember the publishing dates i just remember when i've read them yep. um so but it was hey come over here meet this guy ian you'll like him and your wife and your wife is amazing and uh, mm-hmm. she likes to poke people with swords also which makes yep. her close to my heart we could uh there's a sisterhood of sword swords women out there. <laughs> so yep. yeah, the uh the first thing I ever gave her, it was our first Christmas together when we were dating uh a long, long, long time ago now, uh, was a replica of the Hat of Fang from Lord of the Rings. Cause she's a like a diehard, diehard loader fan. And I knew she fenced. So and I was totally reaching for the Hobbit. stars at that point. And that sword is actually still on our on our mantle as uh to this day. So she is the fencing hobbit. It is great. She is the fencing hobbit. Yep. And she has the height to prove it. <laughs> that sounds like a book David Sashura would write. Sisterhood <laughs> of the Sword. <laughs> it is so is. But okay. So I first met uh, Ian at uh, one of the only cons I went to. And my doctor like us really mad about all the anxiety medicine I took. It's like, you're supposed to take that in a year, not a day. You definitely shouldn't chase it with booze, but you know, live and learn. It uh, works better we, that way. <laughs> right. But we met at the last. <laughs> Uh, honor con uh, while yep. on the vendor's alley we were just shooting the breeze in fact if i remember correctly we were arguing with marco Clus, let us name drop right there about the proper way to put together a burger because as i understand it he was arguing the cheese goes on the bottom or maybe yeah, in reverse i, I, I got 
I, I got no time for that, man. I mean, that's just not, that ain't right with Jesus. Just, you just make a burger, burger, burger up, man. And you put the tomato and then you put the lettuce because that way the tomato doesn't yeah. make a bun wet or get all into the burger and get grossy. Yes, absolutely. The lettuce so, goes on the top underneath the bun for that very yes, reason. To protect that you said. The bun. Yes. And if you have the pickles, you have to make sure the pickles are right there parallel with the tomato or else you get the same problem. But that's assuming that they're fresh pickles. Though sometimes I like to put the pickles on the bottom. I, I, I'm a the fan bird. of having the pickles right on top of the uh, right on top of the patty right there I with the so tomato. No, but I like on the bottom of so it goes bun, pickle, patty, cheese, tomato, for lettuce. So you're both doing it wrong, and this is what I told. But well, this is what I told Ian and Marco Clues at this thing. You know if what? You put cheese you're wrong. If you put cheese on the top and bottom, you don't have to worry about this. It melts on. It protects the burger. It traps the juice. It's good. The problem is if As you put cheese intended. on the bottom, is it kind of just toasts onto, melts onto the bun, not on right. the burger. Yeah. Well, see, if you cook the burger, like then is... you put the cheese, it melts to the burger, and it's glorious. No, 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 no. The melting point of cheese is high enough that it has to, like, steam just a little bit on the actual patty. Yes. Because yes. If you're using real cheese. Yes, Doc and I are in full agreement on that. I um yeah, no, I'm I'm fully on board with that. As far as I'm concerned, the only discussion to be had from this point forward is what kind of cheese said cheese is. Whether you're going with a mild cheese, a white cheese, a provolone, a Swiss, whether you want to go with something a little bit more flavorful and a pepper jack or a I cheddar. I love a hatch cheddar cheese. There you go. There you go. You know it's serious hatch when she starts cheddar. clapping her hands. My unless cheddar. we got unless we got mushrooms. Mushrooms takes it to an entirely different level. Yes. Now we're back on the Swiss bandwagon, and there's really no debating that at all. No, I feel no, like no. this is a panel waiting to happen at a there con, is no guys. debating at that. We've had that count that panel at Fantasy Literature it was all about <laughs> food, but no. But I, I I spend too much time at Fort Bliss, and uh, Hatch Green Chili Cheddar is all about the burger for me. All right. so, heat so cuts the heat cuts the richness and just adds like a spice to it. Have you ever so put pimento cheese on your burger? I'm yes. from Georgia. Of course I have. Got a girl. So what's <laughs> unfair, Seska, is for someone who, like our last interview with him before you got here, he, we also devolved into food. We talked about his Freebird uh, series. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow, for as much as he goes on and on about food, he's in Incredibly skinny, and it's just not fair. No, no, no. My my physician would beg to differ on that. He tells me I'm very much in need of needing to lose some LBs. But and again, isn't that everybody in the day and age of you know the the thing that's been happening for the last year yeah. when we all been stuck at home I mean, near our refrigerators? It's not as bad as like whenever I listen to a Davis or Shura book, I have to have Indian food. Like I spend the entire time craving Indian food. Even <laughs> my family has gone, and you're listening to you're reading that book your author again. I'm like, yes. Right. Like, Pa pass the chicken tikka. Just don't even <laughs> ask. So I, I listen to Harry Dresden books and I just want to eat cold cut sandwiches all day. Like that's all I'm going to do. Uh, <laughs> but you burn any Walmarts down because if that goes with it, you're in trouble. <laughs> all right. Now this is the most, don't spill your mead. That's like a party foul. Even I remember that. But uh, Doc, it's time, for the it, important, yeah, it's time for the important question to decide if he gets to stay on the panel. He gets to stay on the panel because he knows how to put his bur burger together correctly. You but both need to drop and give me 50. That's unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> so the doubles. Stop. The doubles right there. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? You know, once upon a time, this used to be a debate. Um, in recent years, I would say it's not even close. I'm going with Firefly all the way. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up with Star Wars. I grew up with Star Trek starting at the next generation of moving beyond um, those things back in my heyday were awesome. Nowadays they're pretty much just corporatized. They're, they're the big Mac of sci-fi. Now there's just nothing special about them whatsoever. I say Firefly is, on the other hand remains every bit as special as the first day I bought it, the DVDs. And it remains them. pure. Yep. And but can I say there is something ironic about the fact that a TV show about an elegantarian society where things are free Right. You have to pay to watch. Yeah, right. <laughs> there is something <laughs> funny about that. Yeah. Well, you know, we'll we'll see. We'll see how long that how long that lasts. Yeah, you know, we're, about, uh, that was true about Star Wars. I mean, Star Trek too. Didn't they have like a no credit system except for the Ferengis? Uh, yeah. That's exactly what I was <laughs> meaning. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say I thought she was taking a shot at uh, at at 
uh, uh, CBS All Access now rebranded as Paramount Plus because see? nobody wanted to buy CBS All Access. Even so now we're going to try and rebrand it and see if, oh my God, people will come spend our money with us now. And uh, is paying attention to what I'm playing down. Right. I, um, I'm still yeah. mad about your messed up burger order. Yeah, we've talked about that on our show, actually, a, a couple of times, the streaming wars and how that's going to shake out over the next few years. And I'm just sitting back and watching, man. Like, I know everybody's going crazy right now. Everybody wants to have their own service and come pay us and yada, yada, yada. But I think this stuff's going to simmer down in yeah, the next couple I mean, of years. Okay, and you're going to so have like three or four and that'll we, be it. We just cut the, ca- cut the cord, I think is the term, pop culture mm-hmm. term, in our house. And it's going to save us $1,500 a year. And yeah. that's after taking out all the things for the streaming platforms. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I still have basic cable. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, we had basic cable. Mm-hmm. That's the I, thing. It was basic cable. And that's how much we saved after doing the math of adding in all the streaming platforms. I called my cable company and said, listen, I'm out of here. And they said, will you please stay? I said, well, what are you going to do for me? They said, well, what's your price? I said, well, I'm going to pay amount X to have Hulu live, YouTube live, or, you know, anything that's going to give me the sports that I want to watch. And they said, okay, we'll beat that price. And to this day, they're still $10 cheaper than I would pay if I was just buying internet and paying for say Hulu live to get live television. So in other words, I needed to send a Ferengi in to hassle, haggle with them instead of an angry Southern woman. There you go. Angry Southern women's have their place though. Let's let's make the bones about it. Yes, bless their heart. (laughs) So, anyways, moving back on to the fantasy (laughs) (laughs) channel, the show, um, Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, or Lord of the Rings. Which one's your fantasy religion? Um, I'm going to honor my wife and say Lord of the Rings all the way. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. We we went to go. We went to go see, uh, we, we have watched, we've done the movie marathon days to watch the loader trilogy. And then we watched all of the new Hobbit films together because those started popping out shortly after we started dating. So, uh, we saw see, all of those together in the theaters good men and stay married. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I will go with the loader series. Um, definitely, definitely more so than the others. Game of Thrones just kind of wasn't my bag. I, I tried the first series you know, HBO has a very specific brand of entertainment and you either love it. Or it's either for you or it's not. And I, you know, it didn't, it didn't do much for me. Uh, Harry Potter kind of same deal, but loader, I can get on board with some loader. When I was in the service, we used to joke who needs porn when you have HBO and Cinemax. Yeah, pretty much. You know, for all of the talk about, you know, from creatives about, oh, they they let us be ourselves over there. They don't tell us what to do. I'm like, that's bull crap, man. Don't tell me there's not some suit walking into an episode in a writer's room saying, listen, guys, this is a great Game of Thrones episode. But listen, we're going to need a few more beheadings in this scene. I'm sorry. We just we we have a brand to represent here. It's what our viewers expect. We need to lop off some heads here, man. So let's do this. I will say this, the lopping off tons of heads, you know, the number one way to tell if a character is going to die in so, Sword of Fire and Ice, Song of Fire and Ice, mm. is you start to like them. That means JR is going to kill them. Yeah. Or not JR. Yeah. Yeah. George, yep. George Martin, sorry. Jorge, yeah. It's okay. So I uh, just want to you- be like George, so I get them kind of confused. Sure. But sure. what is your first love? Hold Science on, hold on. Hold on. Did you pick Lord of the Rings so your wife doesn't stab you with that nice little sword? No, I'm actually, but well, that's part of it. But I am, uh, <laughs> and I can send pictures of the sword if you would like for social media. Just putting that out there. That would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll share that when we share this episode. But no, I mean, out of out of the three franchises, Loader would definitely get my uh, would definitely get my vote. I mean, jokes aside, before I met my wife, um, I want to say the last film series that I saw all three of the um, all three of the movies with my dad was Lord of the Rings. And oh. going to the movies when we were kids was, I mean, that was a thing that we did. I mean, I kid you not. I was born in 1977. My dad had me as an infant in the theater watching Star Wars. One of my first, and I know we're jumping ahead here, but one of my first memories ever in a movie theater was Empire Strikes Back in 1980. So going to the movies together was something that me and my dad did for as long as I can remember. It was it was a family affair. That's what we did. Um, you know, uh, the Star Trek movies. I remember going to see Star Trek 2, 3, and 4 with him. Um, you know, going to see uh, Batman 1989, Tim Burton, Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton, you know, all of that stuff, the matrix. But I want to say the last big film franchise that he and I went to go see, 
uh, because we were both adults at that point was Lord of the Rings. We saw all three of those together in the theater. It was an event when they came out, he would come up to Tallahassee because he had moved out of town by then. And we'd go hit a matinee and get a popcorn and a big Coke and sit around and, and we'd go to movies together. So no, I will, I will unabashedly stake my claim on loader and say out of those three loader all the way. I don't think I've been to a movie theater since last of the Mohicans. It's been a minute. It has been a minute since that one. Yeah. yeah. And I watched that one in the, what is he called it? The cinema cafe type deals where like, it's, it's not fresh, brand new, but you right. can eat in the restaurant or whatever. Right. Mugs and movies is what we had back home. Yeah. Yeah. But the, one of those deals. So it's been a little bit, I just, I don't know something about a movie. You're just paying so much. The, the snacks are so expensive and with screens getting better and better at home, it's like, man, my lazy boy is kind of comfortable. You know, you can sneak in Twizzlers, right? And M&Ms. <laughs> yeah. Just putting that out there. It's very doable. I mean, you know, depending on who you ask <coughs> my sister wine, also very doable in a movie theater. <laughs> very doable. <laughs> well, there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, but I don't know. My dad was hilarious. He summed up Lord of the Rings for, in his opinion, he woke up, he fell asleep. We, my dad used to fall asleep all the time while watching TV. We joked that that's how we knew it was family time. Right. And my dad woke up and he goes, did you pause the movie or are they still walking? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently Kevin Smith was listening on that conversation. <laughs> so, I think I like him. So, okay. Since you already answered one of our questions, we're going to go though with was sci-fi or fantasy your first love? It was sci-fi. Yeah, it was without a doubt. It was sci-fi. Um, you know, as, as previously stated, my earliest memory in a, in a movie theater was for Empire Strikes Back. I vividly remember being there for Return of the Jedi in, I guess that was 83. Um, after that, you know, begins the run of Star Trek films. So you mm -hmm. had Wrath of Khan, you had Search for Spock, you had um, uh, the whale one, number four. <laughs> uh, saw all of those in the theater right around 1987. Star Trek The Next Generation comes out, and we were off and running to the races. I watched all of Next Generation. I even stalked the little programmer lady at my local ABC affiliate in Tallahassee for pictures and stuff. Uh, my first sci-fi anything did, convention did was a sci-fi. Did you cry when All Good Things Come to an End aired? Uh, no. I mean, by that point, I was just hoping for a good ending. You know, just, just like so many series that make a run past five seasons or so um, you start to teeter on the possibility of, of getting yourself a lost ending. And so you're just really hoping that they land the plane at that point. And, yeah, and I, I thought I TNG did that, okay. I was still young enough that I cried at the end of that dur during the final episode of star Trek. And I, right. I locked everybody else out of the room because I'm not very good with human emotions. Right. <laughs> and I, and I cried while watching it, but, so what was your first sci-fi or fantasy book? First uh, sci-fi or fantasy book. Um, <laughs> I'm probably going to go back to, man, that's sticking way back into the machine. You got to remember, I wasn't a voracious reader until I was later on in life. Um, you know, folks who have met me at cons know this about me. I'm legally blind. So growing up through the 80s, I mean, you had audiobooks on cassette if you were lucky. And that yeah, was no. very, very limited as to what and you And they were get. not very good quality. No, it was horrible. I mean, the book I could not wait to read when I was a kid was Jaws from Peter Benchley, just because I was I was a huge fan of that film. Uh, and I did. I listened to that one several times. Um, you know, once I got to about high school, I had audiobooks on cassette. That certainly made things easier. Um, but they were always abridged, and that was a bummer. So Q and Law, um, you know, a yeah. number of the Star Trek audiobooks were fun because they were read by members of the cast from TNG. Oh, nice. So I, 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 I didn't threw know into that. a bunch of those. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. If you go back and, and delve into that now, stuff, it's a blast. Uh, I Jimmy knew that unabridged audio was not very common until recently. Yeah, uh, yeah. right about the, the early 2000s. Uh, you can thank Audible for that. Once they came around, Audible changed everything. At that point, everybody was unabridged. Um, and, and we were off and running yeah. in large part because of the advent of the, of the iPod. And that was really by all rights. What made me a, a big time reader was because I could carry an entire library in the palm of my hand. 
you know, even, even in the nineties, when we had CDs, it was still very cumbersome to have to pop stuff in and out. You know, the whole notion uh, of being able I, to sit on a Brandon couch and Sanderson's read a book didn't happen. Own. I have Brandon Sanderson's A Way of Kings on audio, on audio book, on audio book CDs. Mm -hmm. It's like 40 CDs. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So, you know, so. being able to finally get into audio books and have everything I wanted right there in my pocket at that point, I read all the time, every time. Um, you know, on the bus, listening to a book, walking down the road to go to the grocery store, listening to a book, walking to the gym, listening to a book. I mean, I was burning through two and three and four books a week, um, just because they were so accessible at that point. I'm and that's pretty much been my life audio. for the last 25 years. Yeah. I'm on my second audio book this week, so I can't say anything. <laughs> there you go. So, and uh, yeah, I mean, as far as, as far as early sci-fi books that, that I really could not wait to read, uh, once it became an option for me to access it, uh, Zahn's Heir to the Empire trilogy was the first place I went. Just because, I mean, I had heard about it from all my Star Wars friends. They're like, oh, if you want to know what happened to Return of the Je after Return of the Jedi, you got to read the Thrawn books. I was like, well, that's wonderful, but I can't get them. You know, they're only available in paperback and I can't access that. So call me yeah. when they're ready. And as soon as those hit the market, and as soon as I was able to get them unabridged, I burned through all three of those in a week. Nice. So, um, yeah. So, so as far as books that I was really, really, really looking forward to getting on to answer your question, I would probably say to the heir to the Empire trilogy from uh, from Tim Zahn because I grew up a Star Wars fan, and like everybody else, I wanted to know what happened, to, you know, after Jedi, and for the better part of two and a half decades, that was the answer was those stories. Nice. So what is it that you love about the science fiction fantasy genre? Um, the spectacle of it and the escapism of it. Um, it it's just freaking cool, guys. I mean, <laughs> I, I know that's an overly simplistic answer, but good no, grief, man. It I is 100% true, you know, though. When you're an eight-year-old, nine-year-old kid and the Millennium Falcon flies across the screen or a gun star from the last Starfighter, old school in the hizzy, um, it was awesome. I mean, it took your breath away and it, it sent your imagination down a rabbit hole that just it never came back from. And in my case, that stuck in me and it's it's been a part of me and who I am and what I love to entertain myself with. For as long as I can remember, whether it was for film or television or, you know, or books, it's just the stuff that I love to think about, you know, and, and when the time came one day down the line to put pen to paper on a story of my own, there was never any doubt. If you ask anybody who's ever known me, it was going to be sci-fi. Like that was just a no brainer because that's all I ever freaking talked about that and music. <laughs> so, uh, no, it was, it was sci-fi all the way. There was never a doubt in that. So how did your love of reading science fiction and fantasy transition into you writing sci-fi? Uh, well, I mean, the whole writing process just happened as a, as an outlet, really. Um, you know, 2008 hit, uh, I was in the middle of a divorce, uh, nasty times. I was in the middle of a career crisis because the economy tanked and nobody wanted sports writers. Um, you know, one thing about the sports business Every kid growing up who loves sports thinks they want to work in it. And so people who work in sports have no problems getting work for free via interns. Why people, why pay people when you have an entire labor force out there who will happily work for free just because they think they love your product. Um, so, you know, when the economy fell apart in 2008, I was left unemployed like everybody else. I had gone back to Florida state to finish my PhD uh, and the first thing to go was our doctoral stipends. Well, I was going through a divorce, which meant my stipend was my only source of income. When that went away, I was screwed. So I got out like everybody else and started beating the bushes to look for a job. And that meant day after day after day of cover letters and resumes and follow-up emails and phone calls and just the drudgery of looking for a job at a time in the world when everybody else was doing the same thing. And so you're competing with all those people. And I, I hit a point when it was just like, I, I got to have something here to blast off some of the stuff that's in my brain and just vent some of this. And I had this goofy story idea about a bunch of buddies from college who all hung out at the bar and stood by each other through thick and thin. And now they're all in their 30s and life has not turned out for any of them the way that they had hoped for a myriad different reasons. But they hang out together on Friday nights and they play a game online because it's how they stay connected and keep in touch with each other. And then they find out that maybe the game wasn't just a game, that maybe somebody was watching them for something. And 
Cheers meets yeah. Last Starfighter. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Um, I, I've always kind of likened it to the Italian job uh, meets the Last Starfighter. Um, you know, for anybody who's ever watched the Italian job or, or Ocean's Eleven, that kind of crew mentality where everybody has their own personality and, and kind of expertise. That was very much what the Mako story became to be. But um, but anyway, but I, I had this kind of goofy story idea. I had a pretty clear idea of who all the players were going to be and the characters were going to be. And so I just started sketching out some bios. And I, you know, whenever I would get out on Friday nights to go to the bar with my buddy, Chris, and, you know, he would have to sit there on the stool next to me and listen to me drone on about the only thing in my life that I gave a crap about, which was these imaginary characters. And he was just like, dude, at some point, just write the, write the freaking book. Just, just write a story. Just write it. Like, whatever. Just, just shut up. Just write it. So I did that. And six months later, I had a first draft and I just, I played with it for a while. And, you know, shortly thereafter, I finally landed a job that moved me to North Carolina. I worked as a contractor on post at Fort Bragg, um, you know, and, and once I got here, I, I started kind of, you know, asking around like, okay, well, I got this thing. I, I might as well see if I can find somebody who can help me polish it up into something readable because I certainly don't know what that looks like, you know? Um, so I got hooked on with some editors and, and got it polished up and then decided, well, you know, they got this indie thing now on Amazon where they'll let you publish a book. Let, let, let me see what that does. I shot that nobody wanted to buy it. So like, all right, well, you know, I'll put it out. If somebody, you know, pays me a buck for it and they enjoy it, then, hey, we all win here, you know? And so I put it out and it did remarkably well. This was right around 2013. And, uh, and I made enough off of Mako to cash flow the rest of the trilogy. And, and I, I fell in love with the whole process of crafting story through that. And yeah, by the time I got done with the trilogy and, and had moved into my next book, it, it, it was that, okay, this is what I'm doing now. I have a day job just like everybody else. Cause I don't like being poor and I like, you know, health insurance. Stable, um, low yes, income. yes. But you know, the book stuff is still kind of where my heart lies and what I love to do. And, you know, before we got on, I mentioned to you guys, I'm like, all right, y'all are keeping me up past my bedtime. <laughs> like that's real. I'm typically up by four, four fifteen. And I take an hour. I let my dog out. You know, we drink some coffee. We sit on the couch. We ease into our morning. And then I'm in the office between 5 and 5.30. And that's where I'm at writing until 8 when I have to log on for my day job. So, uh, so it's, it's, and I do that because I just freaking enjoy doing it. More but that's how it all started. More power to you. I'm like somebody who's in bit, still in basic training. Like I get up. I put on my clothes, I get out the door and I go. Right. There, there is no like <laughs> easing into my day. Like no, no. No. I need I need my coffee. I need a little bit of couch time. My dog will be very unhappy with me if she doesn't get a little blanket time first thing in the morning because we go out and handle our stuff and come in and she eats her breakfast and she's ready to crawl up under a blanket at some point and hang out for a while. So we, uh, you know, we drink our coffee and scroll through the, the phone a little bit. And, uh, and then by that point, by the time I'm done with cup number two, I'll pour cup number three and then it's up into the office. I go. Yeah. No, no. I'm like, I, I mean, I, I my, man, my drill sergeants would be so proud. Even now I put my lay out my clothes the night before it's like close on out the door within 10 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, more power to you though. JR, save us from our ADD selves. <laughs> All right. So many authors let their own real world experiences influence the stories they tell. So was there any specific formidable moments for you that shaped you as a storyteller? Uh, sure. You know, I mean, if you go read Mako, my first book, Lee Summerston was me in a nutshell. I mean, guy was, you know, his career had bombed out. He was going through a divorce and basically all he had was his friends in the bar and a video game. That was pretty much me. I mean, that was pretty much me through and through in, in 2008, 2009. Um, so yeah, there's, there is a ton of me in that book for the reasons we just talked about a second ago. Um, funny thing about it. And you guys are right. You know, y'all are writers, people who watch the show are writers. Everybody knows this funny thing is when you write characters, a lot of times people step to the forefront that you never plan to see become a mainstay in your series. <clears throat> and that happened with me. You know, Lee was the, was the protagonist for Mako. And then Danny Tucker pretty well stepped to the forefront starting in book two, and uh, and he he ran through books two and three and then the spinoff book we put out last year in Detrin City Vice never meant for that to happen, but it it just did. Um, and there's a little bit of me in there, too. He's he's a little bit more cocky than I am, but I have been known to talk a little bit of smack from time to time uh, in, in the heat of battle. So uh, that that's definitely in there. 
And, uh, but yeah, so, so that's there. Um, as far as other kind of life things that informed what I do, uh, colonies lost. The protagonist was a, was a cop law enforcement officer. I was very fortunate. I got to spend four years of my career working full time with those folks back home in Tallahassee. I was, you know, civilian employee with the local sheriff's office, but I worked in a crime scene unit and I hung out with cops all day long and got to be friends with them, still friends with them, hung out with them two weekends ago when I was back home for uh, one of my best friend's wedding, who was also a cop. Um, you know, and, and there was a lot of kind of what I learned from those stories and their experiences that went into informing who Trip Hackett was and the way he viewed the world. And that was my book in, in Colonies Lost. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, in answer to your question, I think a little bit of us pours out into all of our characters, whether it's because it's something we firsthand experienced or maybe it's something we'd like to experience or have, you know, have, have thought of at some point in our lives. I think all of that inevitably works its way down into the people that we write. So speaking of foundational moments, you just mentioned that you worked as a technician for your local law enforcement department. Mm -hmm. So we ask all of our authors who were public servants this question, whether military or cop, but how do you feel like your time working for the man uh, affects the stories you tell other than more specific, like an actual cop character, but like think more broadly. I got you. Well, I'd still work for the man today in my day job, just on a, a different level in a different capacity. Um, so that's still in there. Uh, as far as my day job today, it doesn't inform a whole lot of what I do, um, except for um, the science aspect of what I do. As far as the cop stuff, man, I have such an immense respect for the job that those people do. I really do. I mean, the stuff that they deal with that people in the public never hear about, just the little things that they deal with as part of their job. I mean, my hat is so very much off to them and what they do. And when I set out to write trip, I, I had a little bit of that in mind. And, and again, that informed kind of who that character was. So you mentioned that you draw on some people that, you know, uh, as law enforcement and that it affects you the way you write, but does the time working there affect the kind of stories you read or how you engage with what you're reading? Um, I mean, I've certainly read my fair share of cop dramas, uh, the Luke Davenport series from John Sanford, really, really, really good stuff. Um, you know, getting back on the, the sci-fi and the fantasy end of things. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that, uh, that Harry Dresden does a good bit of that. Uh, really, really enjoy those books. Um, let's see here. John Harkness's Quincy Harker series, kind of same deal. It's got that kind of detective oh, aspect, but the, the humor for Harkness is just, you can't be beat. No. So, uh, guys, I hate to do this to you, but for just a second, can you give me a, a break? Cause I apparently have to plug in a power cord cause my battery on my laptop is about to crap out on me and I'm really enjoying this interview and I don't want it to go anywhere. So, uh, <laughs> okay, we can wait for a second, two seconds and I'll be right back. Power gourds are a thing. I wish they came with two. So while we're waiting for him, what were you saying about Harkness? What was that book you were getting all excited about? Quincy Harker. It's a urban fantasy series it, by uh, John Harkness from Falstaff Publishing. And it is very funny. It is almost as funny as his monster uh, Bubba series. Bubba series? Yes, he has a, a monster hunter called Bubba. And we're back. And we're back. And, All right. And fully powered. So we'll have to have, he just dropped a new book. He has a new book coming out. We'll just, we'll, we'll, I'll contact Hartness and make him come on here. All right. We'll browbeat him. Outstanding. All right. Welcome uh, back. It's so only, he, he's very slutty. It only takes, hey, John, you want to come sell a book? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, he uh I I don't see my face. What happened to my face, JR? I don't know. I think you turned I off your camera. Nothing. You turned off your Did camera. I? All right, hey. So, yeah, no, John, if you if you have been to a con and you don't know who John Hartness is, normally he has purple hair. And but he also goes, Come buy my shit so I don't have to pack it. Yes, he is a fan. Yeah, that's very much his way of things. That is very much his personality. And talk about things that show through in your books. That's him through and through when you read his characters. Oh, yeah. 
They're, they're awesome. Um, I almost, he did not win the award for uh, causing me to spill chemicals on myself while laughing at his audiobook. He did not win that one. <laughs> but he came close. Is that what I'm hearing, Doc? He came close. But uh, Nick Podell and uh, Robert Ross and Davis Asura have won those awards. So did anybody die because you blew up a lab? No, I did not blow up a lab. I just spilled a little acid on myself. Just a little, as you do. So. All right, All right guys, I don't know what's going on with my camera, but you just got my audio from here on in, apparently, but I'll try and keep it entertaining for you. All right. Well, we will rock on anyway. Yeah. Um, so, Doc, you get to ask the most. I bring the bad decisions. Yes, you do, Doc. <laughs> so uh, you get to ask him the most important question for you, the fandom nerd questions. Oh, yes. As I apparently am the sage of nerddom uh, or culture, I don't know, something like that. So, have you had any cool fan art or somebody cosplay one of your characters yet? Haven't had the cosplay of the characters, no. I have had people do some sketches of some of the stuff from my Mako series. I had one guy send me a sketch of a Mako a Starfighter, and that was BA. Like, that was way, like, I felt like I had totally arrived as an author at that point. It was a, um, like, this really cool three-dimensional render, and it had all of the details from the way I designed the plane. Right. So listen, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm in my forties. I grew up through the eighties and nineties. All right. When it came to fighters for me, that meant two things. Okay. That meant top gun and it meant Robotech. Okay. So both of those fighters were based, you know, the Robotech was based off of like the Tomcat, which meant, you know, dual fins, variable sweep wings, that kind of look, this guy made all of that happen in his render for my Mako Starfighter and sent it to me. That, very, very, very much a very cool day. So you're not that much older than me. And for me, it was always for Starfighter. Uh, we lost Doc. For me, the Starfighter was always the X-Wing from Star Wars or that weird sort of bubble cone in the back shape from the last Starfighter. Yep, 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 yep. Um, yeah, I, oh, I totally remember the Gunstar. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't I, know what inspired that, though, because I, I mean, there's no obvious parallel. Yeah, uh, in, on a slightly tangential note, uh, please don't let them ever make a sequel to that. There have been rumors that they will do a reboot or a sequel to Last Starfighter. Doesn't need to happen, folks. Just leave it be. It's fine just the way that it is. But yeah, Gun Stars, absolutely. X Wings, absolutely. Veritech Fighters from Robotech, very much. Alpha Fighters, Robotech. Um, yeah, all of, all of that stuff was right in my wheelhouse as a kid, big time. I don't know. Like, so you, I don't want them to redo it because it's good as it was, but you could take the story forward. Cause you know, what happens when he rebuilds the star starfighter core? Nope. Like that, that has story potential in it. Nope. Nope. Let it be, man. Now nope. start. If we have learned nothing from star Wars, it is that some things just don't need to continue. It's fine. Just let it be. Unless you want to tell something that's a completely different story, a la the Mandalorian and take it a completely different direction. Uh, that that can be fine, but I'm kind of over sequel mania, man. I really, really am. Whether it's comic books, whether it's you know the big tentpole sci-fi franchises that we've grown up with, like I'm really am that guy that's just ready for new stuff, which is really more or less why I just read books now, and I don't watch nearly as much television as I used to. When I do, it's typically sports. I get that, but I don't know. So sometimes the story isn't done in a limited, you know, hundred twenty thousand words of a novel or two and a half hours of a movie. So by having that able to keep a storyline going mm -hmm. almost like the mini series approach, you get some of that with the streaming series that you're seeing on, on online, but I don't know. You're right. They can do it badly. And yes. sometimes they can redo it ad nauseum. I mean, how many different Batmans and Supermans, et cetera. Like I get what you're saying, but I, I, a one and done just leaves you unfulfilled. I just don't trust Hollywood not to get in and mess it up. I mean, it's so very rare that you get these guys who will let a creator come in and just make a good film. Uh, you know, that was the one of the reasons why I think Marvel was so successful in the interim was because they they went out and they got good storytellers and good filmmakers and they just let them do their thing. You know, you flip across the street there to D.C. and you see the opposite of that and you see how it just went straight into the tank. The only property they have that's worth a crap was Wonder Woman. And I apparently they dumped all over that in 1984. So, um, you know, I mean, you, you get suits and, and executives involved trying to tell people how to do their jobs and you, you get a Frankenstein's monster a la Joss Whedon's Justice League. So 
I don't know. I, I just, I don't have a whole lot of faith in that machine anymore to crank out quality product. It feels like it's all very formulaic now. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm ready for fresh stuff, man. Fair enough. Fair enough. So has anyone asked for your autograph out in public away from conventions or regular book signing events? Uh, not outside of conventions. No, I uh, have been, have been very happy to get them at cons though. Anytime a reader comes up to me and wants to uh, get a book signed or buy a book and have it signed, that's always such a, such a treat, man. And I'm so ready to get back to that. I have missed that so much. Just the opportunity to be able to hang out with those folks in a face-to-face -face setting, whether it's at a table or whether it's, you know, grabbing a beer at the bar over happy hour and, and just comparing stories about who we are and where we came from and why we like the things that we do. I've missed that experience so much. And, you know, with Fantasy coming up now here in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be at that. Um, I'm, I'm so very ready to get back to that. But to your question, no, not so much out of the con scene, but, um, but you know what? That's fine because the people at the con scene, that's our people and we'll take them all day long. So have you ever spotted anybody out in the wilds reading your books? I, I have. Yes, I have. I have spotted a, a person or two, particularly around Tallahassee, uh, reading, reading the Mako books, particularly because they find out that all of the characters are, you know, from Florida state live in Tallahassee. There's tons of Tallahassee references there. And so, you know, hometown people like to read hometown stories. And so I, I have, uh, I have seen people sporting a, a Mako cover along the way. And that is always a treat. Okay, cool. So finally, what is some, a weird or funny story about an interaction with a fan, uh, with a fan since you started writing that's family friendly for the audience? Obviously, because we try to stay positive here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. <laughs> an interaction with a fan. Um, I can honestly say I have not had any weird experiences. All right, I haven't been asked to sign any body parts that got turned into tattoos or um, or, or anything like that. Um, have been approached by a few people at the bar, uh, at cons, and that is, is never a bad thing. Um, sometimes those conversations roll off swimmingly and we end up standing there for two hours or until I have to go to another panel talking about everything under the sun from sci-fi stuff and reading to, you know, music and sports and cooking. Um, sometimes people come up to you at a con and they really, really, really just want to delve off on some of the most weird esoteric stuff you could possibly imagine. And you're grateful for those people because they read your book too. And you doff the cap and say, thank you so much. And you smile and you're thinking to yourself, dude, eat a cheeseburger. It's a good thing. The wrap <laughs> with all of the freaky deep toppings and weird stuff that accommodate your, diet just everything that's going on and fed up everything would just eat a cheeseburger cheeseburger and fries man it'll make your world a better place <laughs> just get after it but you don't say that you want to be nice and so you just smile and, and move on fair enough so somehow every conversation with you devolves to food this is why i like you <laughs> it's not very good once you start you reset your fasting clock so right it's like, well i i, I had so uh, tomorrow and there is a, there's a, a, a young lady, a, a young lady who hangs out with all of us at, uh, at, at the fantasy scene. She's a very big part of the four horsemen universe, um, that, that everybody knows of on, uh, she actually stopped through our area not too terribly long ago and came, spent some time with us. And she's like, you mean you didn't make me any barbecue? It's like, <laughs> dude. It's kind of a three-day process between the brine and the rub and the smoke. I kind of need a little bit of a heads up. But no, the next time, you, next time we can make it work. Magician, it's always on standby. The what? If you're a meat magician, it's always on standby. You know what? I can't with the barbecue. Like I got friends coming over on Saturday for kind of a little pre-Mother's Day shindig out here at the lake. And I put the Boston butt on Brian at four o'clock this morning when I got up, actually. And it's got to sit there for at least 24 hours. I'm going to let this one go 36 because it's a really good brine. And then I'll rub it down tomorrow night with the seasoning stuff that I use. Let that sit overnight and soak into the meat. And then that'll go on hickory chips at about 4 a.m. on Saturday and smoke for a good nine hours. Good thing so, you wake up early, man. Uh, yeah, that's not typically my jam on Saturdays, but you know, for my buddy, I will I will make that happen for him. How about for so that, your wife? 
Well, uh, she she's going to be there too, but she gets to sample the cuisine all the time. We uh we actually have a routine in our house where we kind of rotate menus every week. So uh, every other week, it's my turn to plan the menu and cook the meals and da 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 da. da. So so I I get to cook for her on a very regular basis. So when we meet our first ET, it's going to be you and I, and we're going to be determining how best to cook the aliens. There you, you know. go. Because <laughs> you know, space cow's got a space cow, right? Yeah, something to that effect. That's what they say. All right, Doc. Next question. Okay. Yeah. I love you, crazy men. Okay. (laughs) So we've talked about a bunch of stuff, but let's talk about everything Ian J. Malone. That what have you written? Can you give us a Reader's Digest version of your bibliography. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it started with uh, mm-hmm. with Mako. That was my first novel. Uh, that begot the rest of the Mako Saga trilogy, which was Mako, Red Sky Dawning, and At Circle's End. Uh, after mm-hmm. that, I wrote Colonies Lost, which is kind of my alt history take, sci fi take on what happened to the col- lost colonists of Roanoke Island, a little North Carolina history there. Um, after that, I wrote Freebird Rising which was my first foray into the Four Horsemen universe. After that, I wrote Detron City Vice, which is um, uh, my first Mako spinoff set after the events of At Circle's End, which is kind of my om- sci-fi homage to Miami Vice, which was something I loved as a kid. Um, and then I just wrapped my seventh novel. That is The Street Survivor. That is a direct sequel to Freebird Rising in the 4HU, but it also fits into the ongoing series that's happening right now called The Guild Wars. So for people who follow the 4HU, if you haven't read Freebird Rising, might want to grab that and give it a quick read uh, just to to get familiar with the characters and the people that are going to be involved in this story because the stuff that happens to them in this fits directly into the big events that are happening right now in the 4HU with the Guild Wars. So, um, so, And then I got short stories abounding and everything from 4HU to Kevin Steverson's Salvage Universe and all kinds of stuff. So speaking of all of that, but we're going to, yeah. is that's fascinating, but we are going to zero in and focus our interest today on street survivors. Yeah. So where did you get the premise of this universe? Was it to, um, and how, because I know it's part of the bigger series, but mm-hmm. did it come from Ouija boards, psychedelics, tainted barbecue, too many assassin memes? No, it, uh, it actually came from a Leonard Skinner documentary. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where it came from. Freebird that's- Rising, Street Survivors. For people who know Leonard Skinner, you'll see themes there. The main character is a kid named Van Zant from Jacksonville, whose brother died in a tragic starship accident. All right. So we, we see any parallels here. Uh, and that's actually a true story. I had just wrapped watching a Leonard Skinner documentary with Nat- Natalie's. My wife is just as big a music nut as I am. And so like music docs, when there's nothing on TV, we can always find a music doc that we'll check out. And we had just watched um, a big thing called um, Gone with the Wind, the Rise and Tragic Fall of Leonard Skinner. It's on Amazon Prime. Great documentary if you're a rock and roll fan, uh, rock history fan. Anyway, we had just watched this documentary. It was really, really, really riveting stuff. And so I I had grown up. I'm from North Florida. So right up the road from Jacksonville, right up I-10. So Leonard Skinner, Allman Brothers, Marshall Tucker Band. Like That was my jam growing up as a kid. Um, So, you know, Skinner, all that was very much in my wheelhouse. And and the documentary really hit home for me on a lot of levels. So right about that time, Chris and Mark Wandry had approached me about writing a short story set in their Four Horsemen universe. So I wrote the short story for a few credits more, which was the name of the anthology about a kid in Jacksonville in the 23rd century, whose brother had died in a tragic starship accident. And he had been the head of a mercenary company that had really risen to the ranks and to become this really big thing in that region. And then he died. So he's being approached. The younger brother is now being approached by an investor who's saying, we want to get into the mercenary business and we want to resurrect your brother's company, but we don't want to do it without a Van Zandt at the helm. You have to do it. We won't do this without you. And by this point, the creditors came in and took this this guy's family stuff like nothing. They're back in, in poverty because the brother who died didn't have a will. So, you know, when he was gone, like that was it. Their lives got completely turned upside down. And now this kid has a, a decision to make. Do I violate the promise that I made to my mom that none of her other kids would ever go murk uh, and, and pick my, pam- uh, my family up out of the doldrums? Or do I honor it and stay here at the bar slinging drinks all day to pirates? And, uh, and that was the short story and people really responded to it. And so, you know, when it came time to write a book, I said, well, let's, let's write the Van Zandt kid. And we did it and it became Freebird rising, which was kind of a coming of age story about this kid taking over this company. 
and and along the way figuring out what happened to his brother it wasn't an accident how the brother had died and you know getting a chance to weave that story into the overall mythos of what is this monster of a series you know monster of a universe called the 4HU was just a blast and ever since I've written Free Bird like that was came out in 2018 that is the book I get asked about the most when are you going to write a sequel um, you know as authors we love all of our books that goes without saying fans have their favorites they always do and for mine, apparently Free Bird, very much it. And so once I finished Detron City Vice, which was a pet project I'd wanted to do for a long time, I pitched a story to Chris Kennedy uh, for a sequel to Free Bird Rising. And he read it, and he liked it, and he took it to Mark, and Mark liked it. And they said, this is really interesting because there's some stuff going on right now in the Guild Wars that we think this story is suited to help us achieve. Like there's some places that we need to go with our story. And we think you've crafted something here that can really slide into to what's happening and be a nice connector into where we need to go. What do you think about, we're going to give you some, some things that nobody else knows about what's coming down the pike in the 4HU. You noodle that around for a little bit and get back to us and see what you think. So I took it for about two or three weeks and, uh, and I thought, yeah, yeah, this, this could be very fun. This is very interesting. And I felt like the, you know, kind of the, the pointers that they gave me really took the story that I had and just amped it up to 11. I mean, it was a good story as it was about a you know, rival Merck company from Jacksonville and a, you know, a feud with the Eagles. And, and it was great. I mean, I was really happy with it. But the stuff that they gave me really took it and put just a wonderful little cherry on the top that just amped it up to, like I said, to 11. And so I, you know, I reworked the pitch and sent it back to Chris. And he was like, I like this so much. I want to collaborate with you on it. But, you know, will you work with me? I was like, dude, you're the co-creator of the universe. Yes, I will freaking work with you. So uh, so we put pen to paper starting in November. And four months later, the whole thing was done. And we we banged it out. Like it was a it was a well-oiled machine. Once we got rolling and once we kind of found our stride working together as a, as a partnership, because he had done that before. I had not. That was all news to me. Uh, but once we hit our stride with that and really got rocking and rolling, the story came together like a dream. And by the time it was done, we had something that I think both of us were really very, very, very proud of. And so that will release on, you know, here in a couple of weeks uh, on May the 21st at Fantasy. So for people who will be at that convention in Durham, North Carolina, you'll have opportunities to pick up paperbacks right there on the spot. Uh, for everybody else, it'll go worldwide that day. Uh, I'm not sure if Chris is planning on doing a pre-order the week before or like a, a pre-purchase. He's been doing that with some of his newer books. Um, but you can certainly look that up. It's chriskennedypublishing.com. Everything about all of my books is pretty much there. But that's kind of the story of Street Survivors. Um, I can tell you it is a lean, mean machine of a story. It is probably the tightest book that I've been a part of written. Uh, I've been a part of, of writing. It is There's not an ounce of fat on that story. You know, as, as authors, we're also kind of inner editors and we can always go back and look at stuff and be like, well, I probably could have trimmed that down or I could have done that in, in maybe two paragraphs instead of three street survivors. It is whittled down to a freaking blade. So, um, and by all rights, the early reviews that we've gotten from, from advanced readers are that they really liked that about the story that it hits the ground running and it's a freaking speed demon. So, uh, so anyway, that's street survivors, man. And it hits in a couple of weeks and I'm, I'm stoked to bring it to the people's. Well, I think that's that sounds really exciting. And I think that's also one of the things that's nice when you're writing an established universe. You can spend less time world building and more time straight in the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, yep, um, absolutely. So what what science fiction and fantasy tropes, because fantasy tropes can be used in science fiction, um, like some of our favorite classic Nobel yours, winning, uh, uh, Nebula winning uh, authors. What? Doc, Jerry, we get what? to ask him about the cover first. Oh, we get to ask him about the cover. I was so excited about everything else, though. So, so. so uh, can you tell us the story about this this epic cover art that uh, that you and uh, Chris Kennedy put together for this cover? Like, where, I, where I, did the idea come from? How did the process happen? Oh, that's a toughie. Um, because there's stuff on that cover that I've been asked about, and it's in the story, and I don't want to spoil it for people. <laughs> so no, I gotta be. Would you I gotta, say? I gotta be very careful. Um, but no, it, it's. I mean, it's very much set at the climax of the book. Uh, you have a, okay. a Casper there, which that's the big mech. That's kind of the signature piece of the Horseman use uh, for Horseman Universe. The alien there, kind of the wasp bee looking guy. That's what's called a Kishaw. Um, you know, they're they're a species that have been introduced prior to my book, but that you get to know very well in this story. 
And, um, you know, the, the environment around them is very much in the story. And that's so all I have to say that about that. This is that. a scene from the story. Kind of, sort of, yes. Okay. Yes, it is. And Street Survivors, the title is very applicable to one of the themes that I kind of play with in the book. Um, you know, you know, Cisco, your point a second ago, the joy of being able to play in, in an established universe is you get to go spend your time in your story talking about other things. And for me, that's the people. You know, I, I kind of hang my hat on that, that I just enjoy writing characters. That's where I love to play is between the quotation marks and um, and getting a chance to do that and, and work with these characters again has been a lot of fun. But the notion of street survivors and, and what that means within the context of these characters, it's my hope by the time readers get to the end of the book, they're going to understand why we titled it that. But that means something. That's not just a random, hey, let's plug in a title and go with it because it's, you know, a Leonard Skinner album. It's that's in the story. Rock on. So um, can you tell us a bit about what makes this character? Well, actually, we started to talk about tropes. What tropes do you think your story brings in that are just you really hit well? Um, it, it's about, you know, the Freebird books, the Van Zant books, the Swamp Eagle books, whatever you want to call them in the 4HU are, um, are very much about family. That is a, and you know, we were talking before, man, Star Tra Star Wars versus Star Trek versus Firefly. What does everybody love about Firefly? Family. Like that is what that, that series is known for is the sense of family that was shown on the screen and that's embraced among fandom about that. Um, uh, that weaves its way inevitably into everything that I do. And I think that the free bird books very much embrace that on a lot of levels. Obviously there's the, you know, there's the surface level stuff with the Van Zant family, the legacy of the brother being who he was being this icon of, of, you know, the mercenary world uh, going away at the, at the peak of his success. Now the little brother with the same name and the same company and the same logo, you know, the same insignia, being asked to pick up the mantle, pick up the pieces. How does he handle that? You know, how does he handle the weight of that? Um, not only the name, but the responsibility of now knowing that, Hey, you know, six months ago I was slinging drinks in a bar in a Jacksonville starport. Now I'm commanding missions with people's lives on the line. How does he adapt to that? How does he learn? Um, you know, how does he learn to be in charge of that? Um, that's something that we address a lot. Freebird rising deals with that very heavy uh, street survivors is kind of the next the next iteration of that it's it's him getting comfortable in the big chair. You know, book one was about, you've got to sit in this, whether you want to or not. He does. He, he figures it out. Book two is him now starting to try and become comfortable in that role, but then having to face the nasty stuff that can happen in combat and in war. Um, you know, there, there are casualties in street survivors and big time casualties that he hasn't experienced that yet. And so the, you know, again, the weight of command, what does that mean? Very much addressed in these books through that character. But, you know, the thing I love about Taylor Van Zandt, and this hits with a lot of the characters that I write, he's just a good dude. And that's really the best thing that you can say about him. He's just a good dude with a good heart. And, you know, in an age when everybody loves the antihero and the Batmans and this, that, and the other, we love to see our heroes fall and this, that, and the other. And, and there's some truth to that. Chris Kennedy and, I've, and I have had this discussion ad nauseum. Sometimes it's just nice to root for good people who do the right thing because there's no other reason than it's just the right thing to do. And Taylor Van Zant is very much that character. And that's not to say he's flawless. He makes mistakes. He makes, you know, he fouls up decisions from time to time, whether it's for inexperience or what have you. But, but at his core, he does want to do the right thing by the people that are around him. And um, as a writer, I just really enjoy getting into the head of somebody with that code and, and that set of standards to operate by. Um, I just I like to root for those people in real life. And when it comes time to put that stuff on the page, I like to root for them in a story, too. And so, you know, apparently so to my readers because it's sold a few copies, which awesome. Love you guys. Thank you so much. So uh, you, you mentioned that this is uh, The Four Horsemen, which most people who know about it realize it's military science fiction. So since you asked that, answered that question, I'm going to throw one, uh, one out to you that, that you didn't prep for. So you mentioned that you're a music buff. So yeah, if yeah. you were going to pick one song to headline the Street Survivor um, CD like soundtrack, what would the song be? 
one song to headline street survivors, huh? Like, um, well, obviously it's gotta be a Skinner song when you really get right, get right down to it. Um, maybe all I can do is write about it in a song. That was a B side off of, I think it was give me back my bullets. That's probably one of the more famous deep tracks from the Leonard Skinner library. Um, Good it's answer. just, it's a song. It's a song about home and missing home and family and knowing who you are and where you came from, even when the world around you doesn't make that much sense. So I would probably go with, with that one. Uh, give me back. My bullets is obviously a great and easy pick for a military sci-fi novel, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the heart and soul of what these books are, I'd say, yeah, all I can do is write about it is probably a, a good hit for that. Although I would add for, for people who don't know me and don't know my stuff, but you do know the 4-HU. Um, it is a military science fiction universe. And so obviously we're going to hit a lot of those tropes with the way our characters are built and our worlds are built. But, you know, I kind of pride myself on being a, a, you know, a very much a character guy and I love whodunit stories. So really the theme of the first book is finding out what happened to the brother and learning new things about the world around you and looking in the shadows of what's unseen and the players behind the curtain. And those are all tropes I love to play with. And I did it in Freebird Rising and we get to do it again, Chris and I, with Street Survivors. So that's very much in there. Okay, Doc, the next question is you. So you've told us a lot about Van Ant, um, your main character. Yep. But can you tell us about maybe your favorite secondary character? Billy Dawson, his exo. Okay. Um, yeah, Billy is, um, I don't know how, if you guys are familiar with this or not, uh, the, the Marshall University football plane crash back in, I think it was 1970. Disney did a mm -hmm. film about it called We Are Marshall. Even um, I know about it. And we yeah. established One, before the show that when people are talking at work about sports, I'm like, wait, what is it again? Baseball? Soccer? Right. Hockey? So, so yeah. We are Marshall. Um, Red Dawson was one of the was the coach who was supposed to be on that plane, and somebody else took his seat while he went on a recruiting trip, so the other guy could go home to his family. And the plane crashed, and he lived, and pretty much everybody he knew and cared about died on that plane crash, and he was the man left behind. When I wrote Billy Dawson. Red Dawson's real name was William Dawson. I don't know if anybody knows that or not. Red was just his nickname. Um, but when I went to craft that character of the guy who was left behind from the original Swamp Eagle security, who knew the brother and had worked alongside him, you know, side by side to build that company to what it was before it fell, only to be left behind, that became the character of Billy Dawson, the EXO, who was a friend to the family, a friend to Taylor, friend to the brother. And he left the company for reasons that are explained in Freebird Rising and then came back when the company was resurrected because he had to stand by the family and he wasn't going to let Taylor go it alone. And so he came back and became his exo. Um, Billy's a character that was just a lot of fun to write for a lot of different reasons, but there was a lot of depth to him. And honestly, if I ever get a chance to write a spinoff novel, he would probably be on up there of, of the characters that I would probably choose to write about. So Billy Dawson. Okay. Great, awesome. great answer. So does this book specifically have a bad guy you can tell us about without giving away any spoilers? I can't. Nope. Okay. Can't. Because for those, question, for those for those who read for those who have read Freebird Rising, there's it's all connected. And and to even tip my cap on that is um I'm I'm not a spoiler guy, man. I want people just to read it and 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 find out what happens and hopefully throw their book against the wall. That's what I, I'm aiming for. I can understand that. So now we get to ask the back alley question. So as an author, you do lots of mean things to your characters because you're just an evil, horrible person to them. So if you met them in a back alley, how do you think that's going to go? Are they going to kill you? Are going to cry over some beer with you? Are they going to say, I'll forgive everything if you cook me some barbecue? You can tell I've started my fast. But how do you think that plays out? There will be some beverages. Uh, that's how things will start there. There will be some adult beverages. Uh, it could lead to baseball bats, depending on which characters we're talking about, because there are a couple. Uh, one that I just wrapped today, actually, I had to submit a short story for an anthology and a character that I created like two or three years ago um, met, a, met an end 
And it was totally one of those unplanned things. I had no idea that was going to happen until I got to the end of the story and was just like, oh, holy crap. So this is the way that we're going. And it, it made perfect sense. And so I finished out the story and I wrote that in. And um, that actually kind of broke my heart because he was a guy that I was actually looking forward to going back and writing at some point. And well, now I won't unless it's a flashback. So uh, I'm pretty sure he would have some strong words for me. Like, yo, dude, like I didn't even get my day. Some guys get their day and then they just go by the wayside. I didn't even get a chance at the majors. You killed me in the freaking minor leagues. So uh, anyway, that that's that's how that would go. Okay. And so speaking of uh, that, uh, we're going to give you a sneak peek of how the sausage was made. Yes, another food reference. But were there any cool scenes that you had to cut from the final version of this book? Of Street Survivors? Yeah. Uh there was one. Yeah, there was, there was one that was, um, that was just kind of a, 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 you know, a, a sitting around the dinner table scene with a couple of characters getting to know each other and figuring some stuff out about each other. That is as much as I really liked it. And as much as I love the heart of it, it just wasn't terribly pertinent into the story. And it was one of those things that from a pacing standpoint, you really gotta, you gotta start hitting it here, man, or you're going to, people are going to get bored. And so it, it got cut and who knows, maybe it'll make its way onto the interwebs one day as an outtake or something like that. But yeah, it was just, it was a really, really nice scene that just didn't really have to be in this story. And so it got cut in the name of keeping things tight. You know, like I said, street survivors runs. I mean, it's probably my shortest story to boot. I want to say by the time we wrapped it, it's around 70,000, 72,000 words. Um, so it's, it's, it's a rocket ship. But that was part of it. I mean, that was it was what that story needed to be. And as much as I love this chapter, it was kind of detrimental to that. And so it it got cut. Okay. And uh, in case someone is living under a rock and they don't know what the Four Horsemen universe is, can you give the the listeners or viewers over on the YouTube's a Reader's Digest version of this world? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's set a couple of hundred years from now, and uh, and basically we get visited by a group of aliens who uh, represent our representatives from the Galactic Union, and they're checking us out for membership, and they look around and say, nah, you guys aren't ready. And they get ready to load up on the ship and take off, and then ISIS bombs them and blows them all to hell. Well, they respond by wiping Iran off the map. All right, so that's the end of that. But through the process, through the exchange, they learn, you guys aren't terribly smart down here on Earth, and you're definitely primitive, but holy crap, can you blow some stuff up? So here's the deal. We'll give you an opportunity to join the Galactic Union, but you're going to have to do it as part of the Mercenary Guild. Take it or leave it. So naturally, we take it. All right. We're all about it. And every ex, you know, ex military guy loads up and says, I'm going to roll out and kill aliens and get paid, you know, as as the the 4HU saying goes. And so by the scores, they load up, run out into the stars and start collecting these contracts, hundreds of companies, and they all get wiped out every single one of them, except for four. And as coincidence would have them, every one of those four mercenary companies that returns has a horse in the logo. And so begins the four horsemen. Uh, fast forward about a hundred years. And that's when the first book in the four HU is set. Humanity has had a chance to kind of learn from their mistakes. Now we're back out into the stars. We're taking mercenary contracts, but we're a little smarter about what we do. But I mean, as members of the, the greater galactic community go, we're still very much newborns. We're still very much learning things, but that all changes real quick and in a hurry. And there's been what 50, 60 books now put out in the 4HU between Mark Wandry, Chris Kennedy, Kevin Eikenberry, and ev- myself and everybody in between. So it's it has grown exponentially over the last several years. But that's how it all started. And that's basically the core of what the 4HU is. Okay. Doc, the next question is yours. So Street Survivor is definitely part of a series. It sounds like it's book two in in your specific story arc within the 4HU. So is this story done? Are we going to see more of these characters later yes. on? Yes, okay. that I can tell you. It's, uh, that's already in the works. By the time we got to the end of Street Survivors, it became very clear to both Chris and myself that, yeah, there's there's still some story to be told here big time. And so that is already that is already in the works. And so, when you get to the epilogue of Street Survivors, you're going to know exactly what that looks like. So 
we've talked a bit about 4HU. There, we have some listeners, I'm sure, who are very familiar with it. However, can you give us like a, a snippet of what some of the consistent rules of the science and technology are in, are within the 4HU? Did you like add any uh, Ian Maloney spice to it? No, no, I don't play with that stuff. Uh, Mark is Mark Wandry is the creator. He's pretty specific about what he does and does not allow in his sandbox, as is typical of pretty much any really good creator. Uh, when you create something that's good, you don't mess with the formula a whole lot. In the case of the 4HU, um, Mech Warfare reigns supreme. Uh, so the Casper, that got stands for Combat Assault Systems Personnel. Um, that is the, the big, you know, eight, 10 foot mech, depending on which model you're dealing with that you see on the cover of street survivors. That is the signature piece. All right. That is the, the gun star to use the, the last starfighter reference of the 4HU. That is the signature piece that everybody looks for. Um, as, as far as how it travels or, you know, how it, how it works, there is no, um, artificial gravity. So when you're in space, you're kind of on your own unless you have a, a ship that has a grav deck and then you can build it that way. But that has its its downsides as well. Um, hyperspace is a bit tricky. It does use uh, stargates to get to and from different parts of the galaxy. But jumps take a very set number of time, uh, depending on uh, regardless of, of where you're going in the Union. Um, and again, there's reason behind all of that. And if you read the Four Horsemen books, all that's very clearly laid out in books like Wing Tazars or the Golden Horde. Um, you know, they had a, to their credit, to Mark and Chris's credit, they were very uh, precise on where they wanted that to go when they built it. And they, they integrated that into the foundation and the work from there. And I think to the 4HU's credit, that's why it's been so successful is because Mark did have such a clear vision for what that was going to be from the ground up. And he never wavered off of that. So, so what would be your favorite piece of tech that you could, if you, if you could pick anything, steal and use today, what would be your favorite piece of tech to do that with? Uh, from the 4HU? Gotta be a Casper, dude. Oh yeah, it's, it's a Casper all the way. Those things are freaking bad. Whether it's the chain guns, I mean, depending on how it's tricked out and what model you've got, uh, the arm blades are really freaking awesome. I mean, they're just, who doesn't love a 10 foot tall mech, dude? I mean, seriously, if you've ever been into sci-fi, how do you not love one of those things and want to take one for a test drive? I mean, rockets, you name it. It's they are they're bad to the bone. So yeah, hands down, it'd be a Casper all the way. So did you come up with any aliens for this new book? Did you make any oh, new aliens? Hold on. This is the most important question, which is why we added it. If you had a Casper for daily use, how would you abuse the the privilege? Because <laughs> if uh, I had well, the force, you know I'm going to do horrible things with it. Sure. Well, I, I can tell you, traffic in Raleigh Durham wouldn't be a problem. Uh, <laughs> that that would be taken care of real quick in a hurry. I forty can pretty much no suck it at that point. Durham. You what? I'm pretty sure that it's not that bad. Oh, you've uh, oh, <laughs> please just uh, come on down, come on down in, in eight o'clock traffic uh, on a on a Tuesday morning from Raleigh or Cary heading into Research Triangle Park or coming from Chapel Hill into Research Triangle Park. It's a freaking parking lot. It's not Atlanta, you know, to, to your credit, to your point, but it is not, it is not small town USA. I-40 sucks. Um, and anybody who lives here will tell you that. So yeah, that I'd put it in traffic and that'd be that. <laughs> okay. Now you can ask him about his aliens. So did you create any aliens for this book or the 4HU? I did. Um, I did. I got to create um, a, a, a race called the Krulig in Freebird Rising that um, that date very much back to the to the origins of the Galactic Union. Um, that was something that was a lot of fun about Freebird. Was in addition to telling my little Van Zant story, I also got to weave that into the fabric of kind of the backstory of where the the four HU as we know it came from, and that started with creating a, a villain that traced back to the beginnings of the GE, uh, you know, of their lineage. It traced all the way back to the beginning of the Galactic Union after the, the big ancient war. Um, so that was in Freebird. And this one, I don't create any aliens that are, are big time players, but I do get to create a couple on the periphery. I created a race called the Dutaya, yeah. who are oh, kind of like uh, yeah. pirates, and they were a lot of fun to play with. Uh, and then I created a race of companions to borrow a, uh, a firefly phrase who are psychic. So, um, so yeah. when you created these two new species, did you, uh, 
set out about making it whole cloth or did you uh, piece together different things and let um, the Ouija board guide you? What? Yeah, I just kind of, I just let my brain roll. Like once I kind of have a vibe for what they're going to look like, if I'm dealing with an insectoid species or, you know, a slug species or a humanoid species, you know, once I, once I kind of let that, I have that established, then it's like we talked about before it gets back to, okay, who are these people? You know, what, what is their objective? What do they do? What is their, what are they trying to achieve? And are we talking about pirates? Okay. Well then let's research some pirates, you know, let's study Blackbeard. You know, let's, let's study how he operated. How did that, you know, what was his modus operandi? How did he function? You know, why was he so revered as a pirate? And then I weave that kind of stuff into the characters that I'm writing. Um, I'm a history channel nut, by the way, that informs a crap ton of stuff that I've written. Like I basically recreated the industrial revolution and colonies lost on a planet. It was wild. Like right down to JD Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, whole spiel was awesome. Okay. So, uh, clearly this interview is winding down on the count of we've been at it for an hour and now I'm very hungry. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> can you, uh, is there anything about street survivors that we didn't ask you that you want to tell us before we wrap this up? Just make sure you read to the end. Uh, because again, by the time we got to the end of the story, Chris and I were very clear on, okay, this is, there's more to this. All right. And, and don't get me wrong. Street survivors is a perfectly compact story. You can read it from beginning to end. It is a complete story. There are no cliffhangers here. Um, but you know, we, we did realize when writing the final chapter that, okay, this is, this is going to go elsewhere. So how do we bridge that? How do we set the table for that? And that became the epilogue, which God, we had a lot of fun writing. Um, but anyway, so, so read to the end, make sure you look between the lines, realize that there's probably on the first read more going on than you think is going on. And, um, and just be mindful because it all comes together in the, in the end. And yeah, to quote Speaking the great of, philosopher Gump, that's all I have to say about that. All right. So because we talked so much about food, if you were going to make the perfect sandwich or meal entree to go with this story, what would they be eating while they read or listen to the audiobook? Because I know Chris Kennedy puts them all out in audiobook. Right. What would be the perfect companion meal for this? Uh, let's see here. For street survivors, you're talking about North Florida. I mean, it really is going to be tough to go wrong with. Uh, with a good old fashioned cheeseburger, you know, I mean, there cheeseburger in paradise. It's, it's not fancy, but it is 100% all American to the core. And I think that really kind of speaks to who these guys are. So big old cheeseburger with all the trimmings, lettuce, tomato, onion, pickles, um, big old healthy bun. That's hearty enough to stand up to all that extra stuff. Big old plate of, of pipe and hot French fries. Tough to go wrong with that. Maybe you could get a push out of a good uh, fish sandwich, maybe a black and mahi sandwich because you're on the coast in Jacksonville. So seafood is is there in spades. Maybe you could throw a dime on, on something like that, but it's tough to go wrong with a good cheeseburger and fries, man. Wash down with an ice cold beer. And it's got to be a light domestic beer, by the way, because Taylor Van Zandt drinks cheap beer. That's what he does. <laughs> oh, oh. oh. And he so good up until that moment. No, you, you lost he me was poor. He was poor and he had no freaking money. And then after he had money, he's just like, listen, a man's brand is his brand. Once you're established on something, why mess with it? And so, yeah, he's, I created a, a cheap redneck beer called long branch light. That is essentially the bush light of, uh, of the four horsemen universe. And that's what my man drinks. And he doesn't care how much static people give him for it. That's what he wants. And when he shows up at the bar, he wants a 22 ouncer and a frozen mug. Booyah. No, it's it's all about the bikini oh. Maui blonde lager. It's a uh, no. oh my the god, Bear, you're not allowed to pick the beer either. It's delicious. Oh. It's made locally in Hawaii and shipped here. It is amazing. It made locally the, in Hawaii, half a continent. It's local to the U.S. <laughs> it's local because it's U.S. state that counts. Uh, it's still American. Oh, it does not. Oh, that man. too. It's, I'm gonna have that, to. I'm gonna have to mail you some of that beer, and it's delicious. That is your math skills, dear. That no, too it's, came from, it's, it's American. That too came from me, by the way, because I'm totally a Miller Lite drinker. Like it's, I try craft beer when I go to breweries. I enjoy, you know, going out to local breweries and, and okay, talk to me about what's popular. I'll, I'll try it. But inevitably I'm always back to a, a Miller Lite draft and a frozen mug, man. That That's the way I freaking roll. That's, uh, I'm just no. happy with it. Yep. That's the way I roll, man. That's my jam. 
All right. So she's clearly wrong, uh, but we <laughs> forgive her. But uh, when we started this, you had mentioned that you had a little bit of a charity thing you were doing. So you want to tell us about that real quick? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, I, I have a couple of things that I do. Um, if you go onto my website at ianjmalone.net and click on the patches button, um, I have patches for uh, the Forestman universe. So Swamp Eagle Security, you can buy an Eagles insignia patch there. Uh, I have a patch for the Mako series, which is the Renegades. That's the 82nd Logistical Squadron. Um, and then I have a patch for Detron City Vice, which was the last Mako spinoff book I did. Um, all author royalties from the Detron City Vice patches go to the Concerns of Police Survivors. So that's an organization that's solely dedicated to helping the people who are left behind when you know law enforcement men and women fall in the line of duty. So uh, family members who need to pay for funerals and funeral arrangements. A lot of times these are you know are cops for very small town agencies that have no budget whatsoever. And so when you know someone is killed in the line of duty, like they're scrambling just to find the money to be able to help the family, much less cover a funeral. So cops, concerns of police survivors, that's what they do. That's all they're built to be is a, is a support network to be able to go in and help out those people and help out those agencies. Um, very dear friend of mine is the president of, um, of the chapter down in North Florida, or excuse me, the vice president of the chapter down in North Florida. That's how I learned about them and what they do. Um, and so he kind of got me hooked on with them. And I just, I love the comp. I love the group. I love what they stand for. And so if you buy a Detron city vice patch off of my website, then, um, then yeah, all the proceeds go to benefit the concerns of police survivors. Another thing I'm working on, and this is still kind of in the, in the works. Um, we're putting together an event down in Panama city, Florida at a bar down there. We're going to do a big kind of sci-fi themed author, uh, signing deal and all the proceeds from our door raffle are going to go to benefit the friends of the Bay County public libraries. So, you know, Bay County, Panama city, uh, Mexico beach, that whole area, I mean, everybody just forgets that they got smacked in the face by a cat five hurricane two years ago. And in a large, you know, large regard, they still haven't, a lot of them still haven't recovered from that local businesses, schools. Yeah, they got and, hit by a uh, cat five hurricane and then got hit by, well, yeah. what everybody else got hit by. Exactly. So congratulations. You just got your business up and back on its feet. And now you have to shut it down again. Double header. Right. So they, they've gotten the the double weenie on that one, which just sucks. And so I, I have a fondness for that area because it's where I'm from. I, you know, I grew up in Leon County. I have gobs of history over in Panama city, which is Bay County. Um, and so, you know, when, when I got ready to head down there and, and do an author signing, which just totally happened by chance, uh, I started putting my head together with you know, the guy who owns the bar where this is going to be happening. And, um, and it was just like, let's do something for the, for the local peeps. You know, let's, let's look into some local literacy charities and see if we can really make this count for people right there in town. And that was how I got hooked on with the library and then the friends of the Bay County public libraries. And that's self-explanatory. That's what they do is support the local libraries there in the County. And so we're going to try and raise some money for those folks and donate some books and, you know, get, get some more jingle in their pocket to be able to keep books on shelves for people who can't afford to go drop 15 bucks on a dime at the local bookstore. So, but that's what I got. That's coming up in June. Uh, all of that's on my website at enjmalone.net. You can go read all about it. Speaking of reading all about it, can you tell listeners and viewers where they can find you? The one, the only Mr. Ian J. Malone. <laughs> uh, yep. So on the web, ianjmalone.net, um, everything I, you know, anything about me is on my news desk. So you can click on that and read anything from uh, book release announcements, event stuff, interviews. Um, you know, I try and keep all of that up there. Uh, if you subscribe to my newsletter, uh, you get three free short stories. So nothing wrong with free books. So help your help yourself to that. Um, on social media, I do the Facebook thing. Uh, you can follow my personal profile. Just uh, you know, run a search for Ian J Malone. Click the follow button, and away you go. Uh, and then I'm also on Twitter at Ian J Malone. Uh, there on Twitter, you're gonna get a healthy dose of what I love in sports and music, because uh, that's predominantly what I'm tweeting about and retweeting about. Is it's Adam Schefter and it's the Cincinnati Reds and it's NASCAR and it's Florida state football. And I mean, you're going to get plenty of book stuff along the way, but you're also going to get, you know, links to what I'm listening to on Spotify or YouTube or whatever. Um, and then lastly, you know, the podcast that I'm a part of the dudes in hyperspace podcast, we are everywhere that podcasts are distributed, uh, Apple, Google, Spotify, we simulcast to YouTube. So you can go check that out over there, subscribe to us. Uh, if they'll let you leave stars, please do. We greatly appreciate that. And that is 50% 
a bunch of authors talking about books and writing and 50% authors talking about beer and food and cooking and sports and cars and all the stuff that we've been talking about so far on this podcast. <laughs> so Ow. that's that's my spiel, man. Oh, freaking standing. And you can find us, dear listener or viewer, I don't want to forget you over on the YouTubes, our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades, anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades. We are working on putting together a proper website, but uh, it'll be also linked to our Anchor FM site. Uh, we have Twitter at SF underscore fantasy underscore show, Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to include your favorite recipes for stuff because we like food, apparently. And JR uh, can't cook. No, I can't, but I'm learning. Uh, we have our Facebook group, which is facebook.com backslash blasters and blades podcast, facebook.com backslash blasters and blades podcast. And you can support the show over on uh, Anchor FM. They let you support us monthly, much like a Patreon, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com backslash author JR Hanley, buymeacoffee.com backslash author JR Hanley. Be sure to put in the comments it's for the podcast. And let's be real. They're not really buying coffee with it. We know that Nick and Doc are luscious, so I'll be the designated podcaster, and they can drink for you. Doc, bring it home. You know what? We're not going to break with a system that's working so well for us. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber, the overworked civil servant, and J.R. Hanley, the um, going-to-starve-because-he-can't-cook author. I'm Seska. This is the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week where we will indulge our, ner our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, all things that go boom, and of course, fantasy.